So it is really a pleasure to be here to see such great attendance and to be back in Ireland again, which is always a pleasure. And somehow it seems highly significant to me because I realized really much to my surprise, it hit me that um, if there were an elder abuse survey now and say my wife had insulted or sworn at me in the past year, I would be an elder abuse victim. <laughs> um, it's funny when you turn 60, you're suddenly able to be an elder abuse victim. So, that, uh, so I feel like I have even more investment in this topic uh, than I did a while ago. Um, um, it was very nice when I talked to Mandy. I said, well, what do I need to say about the U.S.? And she said that I could pretty much choose whatever I wanted to talk about or update you on. So uh, by coincidence, and I think it will be of interest, um, I wanted to give you um, um, some remarks about work that we've done in preparation for something called the White House Conference on Aging. Um, and the White House Conference on Aging, because that's where the president lives, is initiated by the president. Uh, it occurs every 10 years. Um, and in the past, these White House conferences have been very influential in terms of policy. Now, it's changed in format somewhat. It's certainly been watered down. But, one, but it's still going to take place, and it still is very important for us. Um, and one of the most important things in our world that happened um, is of, there are four topics being addressed, um, and one of them is elder abuse and neglect and financial exploitation. So it was chosen as one of the key topics for this year's White House Conference. Um, and my colleagues and I were invited to do a background paper for that. Uh, at the same time, uh, as, we were, as we were getting ready to do this, the results became available, and I'll give you the website shortly, for a major knowledge gathering project that was done in the US. And this is called the Elder Justice Roadmap. Um, and this roadmap was a massive project in which between 700 and 800 people working in the field of elder abuse in some way all were surveyed. Um, um, but then using a complex concept mapping technique, priorities for action on elder abuse were established, and then they were augmented by expert interviews. So based on that, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what uh, this group and what the, this work in the US has identified as key issues in elder mistreatment um, in preparation for the White House Conference, which is a signature event in the US. So I'd like to share with you some points uh, in the analysis uh, that we came up with about the highest priorities for elder abuse work. And I want to say, I'm not telling you really what's b been done. I'm going to tell you what experts in the US think ought to be done uh, and what policymakers ought to be looking at. Uh, in terms of what's been done, you know, there is a certain a repetitiveness to what others have said. Uh, there's a lot of talk and planning and less actual action, although I will tell you about one major event which occurred. Um, one thing in the U.S. Uh, um, that we've had recently uh, have been advances in prevalence research. So as, as probably almost all of you know, studies of prevalence have been plagued by um, incomplete or inconsistent definitions and questionable research methods. In fact, um, the studies in the U.K. and in Ireland were actually models for how this kind of work ought to be done. Um, and there were recently three major studies which found, found rates in the population that's really pretty high, 7.6% um, and 9% and 11%. Um, and if you consider that a large number of people who are particularly at risk of, dementia, uh, of elder abuse, um, namely folks with dementia, um, are not able to be interviewed in a telephone survey, as are other at-risk categories, we're starting to think uh, that a prevalence rate of around 10% of older people having at least some experience of something that, that someone might call mistreatment uh, is possible. And so that has gotten, that has increased awareness in the US. Um, I apologize for you non-English um, speakers. I, um, I live in the state of New York uh, where people speak very quickly. So I will do my best though um, not to go quite so fast. Uh, you know, and you see headlines like this all the time, um, with, uh, which, which really show, I think, an increasing awareness in the media of this, of this as a problem. Um, I think it's also becoming clear 
that of the 76 million baby boomers who are rapidly entering old age are not going to be immune from elder abuse and neglect. Um, and as they will tap all service systems, now that the leading edge of the baby boom is 70, um, but these issues come to the fore. So this is, I think, the reason why uh, um, a wild mistreatment uh, um, has reached the level of an issue now that's being dealt with at something like um, the White House Conference on Aging. I, I think a lot of you would actually find this elder justice roadmap to be very interesting. It's very user friendly, easy to read, uh, and, and is a major agenda setting effort. Um, you can either take down the, um, uh, the address or simply type Elder Justice Roadmap into a search engine and it's easily downloadable. Um, and I shared you with stakeholders, extensive research review, and expert interviews. Um, so I think, you know, that right, um, right now, uh, uh, there may be a unique opportunity in the U.S. to make some progress on this issue. Uh, if you follow United States politics, there's one thing that's really remarkable, and that is that uh, a desire to end elder mistreatment cuts across both parties and all political divisions. Uh, and both uh, the Republicans and the Democrats have been interested in this, which is highly unusual, um, as you can imagine. Um, uh, um, I suppose um, we're lucky that President Obama has not spoken out in favor of it because that would lose half our Congress, but that's another story. Um, uh, in this area, and I'll touch briefly on these, and if we don't get through all of them, we could talk about them later. Uh, in this work with the Elder Justice Roadmap and our other reviews of literature and policy thinking, there are three particularly pressing topics for consideration in the U.S. Um, and uh, these are, uh, so one is developing, um, improving our knowledge base. Um, one is uh, developing a comprehensive network of elder mistreatment services and coordinating those services and training. And the third is to forge a coordinated policy. Um, and let me just give you a few examples of what I think are the most prominent or perhaps interesting recommendations in some of these domains. Um, you know, in thinking about uh, this knowledge base uh, for elder mistreatment, I have reached an age where I've sort of been in this area. I was um, um, saying to Gary Fitzgerald, I think, it, uh, earlier today, that I probably wrote the first review article I ever wrote on elder abuse in the early 1980s. And in terms of our knowledge about elder abuse, it's really nothing short of tragic that I could simply cut and paste from that article uh, in terms of our lack of knowledge about elder abuse. It's, it, it, um, it really is extraordinary. And but what we know the least about still, and which is virtually unchanged from 40 years ago, is the first uh, point, that we simply know almost nothing, or, or, or let's put it differently, we have almost no hard evidence that any intervention program works for elder mistreatment. And in those studies that used more rigorous evaluation designs, uh, they have typically had negative effects. Um, so the only hard data we have show mildly or very negative effects on things like adult protective services, which has been studied. So that is, I mean, I don't even want to say too much more than that, um, but to say that we still do not have a single evidence-based program to prevent or treat elder abuse. And partly that's due to problems in doing the research and there are other factors. So, but in terms of something which used a randomized control design or some sound design and then was replicated, in, um, in 40 years we have nothing. And so that's something that we hope but that people will address. Um, a second one is a new idea. Uh, and we have some younger colleagues, and, and they're actually more established people who are connecting brain science to elder mistreatment. Um, and in the minister's uh, comments um, um, this morning, a lot of the talk was on capacity. Um, lots of what people are struggling with in elder abuse intervention uh, really has to do with capacity, with decision making, with assessments of risk, um, with the ability to seek help 
with uh, the validity of eyewitness testimony. All of those can now really be addressed uh, um, through some of the remarkable insights which have developed over the last decade on brain changes over the life course. Uh, so I think uh, we need a concerted research agenda that bridges a full continuum from neuroscience to neurocognitive evaluation to real-world functional assessments involving an individual's personal, social, or even economic faculties. Um, and the integration of these kinds of neuroscience um, methods to study the neural determinants of vulnerability to mistreatment. Uh, really are a huge new frontier, I think, in the battle against elder abuse. Um, and, and if we have time, um, there are some good examples. Um, I'll just say with these two, the reason I highlight those last two points uh, is that recent research in the U.S. and elsewhere shows how prevalent they are. Um, in the U.S. prevalent studies I just uh, talked to you about, um, uh, financial mistreatment exceeds uh, physical abuse by three or four times. Uh, and it, uh, there have been recent estimates in the U.S. of billions of dollars of losses as a result. Um, but there's much more that we need to know about it, um, including cognitive vulnerability. Um, we need to know about how to develop interventions at the personal level, so with bankers and other folks. But we also need to think about developing automated systems, like those kind of same um, systems that tell you automatically if a credit card fraud has occurred. People could develop algorithms of this kind um, that would help us to be able to detect um, a financial fraud. Um, and finally, as, I, as, as you heard earlier, um, my recent findings on the prevalence of resident to resident aggression in nursing homes um, as well as ongoing concerns about abuse and long-term care um, suggests that that should be a major topic uh, uh, for research. Um, I'm not going to say much about that because I know this, because I know a number of you work in elder abuse services and you know even better than I do how much we lack uh, a comprehensive network of services. And especially I won't say much about expanding services for elder mistreatment. Obviously, most communities lack a truly comprehensive um, set of services that would make us feel very secure that older victims and, and others are being uh, appropriately managed and helped. Uh, so it comes as no surprise uh, that a recommendation we, would be to expand the entire range of services. Um, I want to say a word, though, about the second recommendation, which is expanding training opportunities. Um, one of these is that we need to expand it to more and different people, uh, you know, like, for example, bankers and financial service types. But also, I think that we need to establish an evidence base for training. Um, we need to understand what kinds of training work best and for whom and under what conditions. Um, uh, the final area I do want to say, uh, um, and I do want to share with you uh, in this context, sorry, one, um, I'm used to having a podium, you know, so, and I'm near, so, I mean, there's just all kinds of problems here. Um, the, uh, um, I want to mention the Elder Justice Act, and it's something, again, I would suggest that you Google or, or uh, look up, because I think the experience of the U.S. Um, might be interesting. This, honestly, was a huge achievement in the U.S. Uh, it was passed in 1910 as part of what's come to be called Obamacare, but which is really called the Affordable Care Act. And its goal was to provide governmental resources to better understand, prevent, and treat, and prosecute elder abuse, neglect, and exploitations. It had wonderful provisions. Um, a National Elder Justice Coordinating Council, which is one of the things which has been implemented, uh, it was going to create elder abuse forensic centers around the country so for helping to process you know, data uh, that would help with prosecution. It was going to fund adult protective services, long-term care ombudsmen, uh, all sorts of other things. Um, an overarching whole goal was to develop these kinds of policy recommendations. Unfortunately, it hasn't been funded. So it's a law on the books that has never been funded. It received a very small amount of funding this year. Um, and that's something, though, that we're hopeful about. It showed really considerable political will. Um, so in conclusion, I'll say that uh, there's a history of discussion about 
um, elder mistreatment and elder justice issues. And a lot of us in the US though think that the occasion of the 2015 White House Conference on Aging um, is a time to bring elder abuse more into the mainstream of policy thinking in the US. Uh, and the theme has never been so urgent given the growth in the number of potential victims and uh, what I've described as a lack of proven effective treatment programs. And left unchecked, it's likely that the hundreds of thousands of boomers um, who enter old age regularly are going to be equally at risk as the current population. Um, um, so we're hoping that things like the attention at the White House Conference on Aging, this Elder Justice Act, um, new prevalence surveys will um, help to galvanize uh, uh, political will, <laughs> help to galvanize the interest of funders and researchers and the creative innovation of the not-for-profit and profit sectors uh, to help us overcome um, the mistreatment and indignity in the later years. Oh, no, no, no. Did I really have two more minutes? <laughs> um, I'd like to tell you a humorous personal <laughs> I was born in a small, yeah, 